So it was in Belfast, Ireland in the 1930s that there was a, a church, actually a pretty good-sized church for that time in that place, church of about 200 people that experienced a revival. And uh, that, that uh, church, uh, the revival was so significant that every evening as they would meet together, um, weeknights, whatever nights, between 12 and 20 people gave their hearts to Christ every single evening, just night after night after night. And it was no secret that the key to that revival was prayer. In fact, every morning, every single morning, people would gather at 6 a.m., crazy bunch, you know, 50 or so people would gather to pray for an hour. Well, there was a young man who was part of that revival. It changed his life. His name's J. Edwin Orr. Uh, J. Edwin Orr was only 18 years old when this revival took place in his church, but it so changed his life that he went on to become a preacher and evangelist. He actually went on to study revivals throughout history. He became the world's leading expert on revival, and uh, quite a neat guy, was friends with Billy Graham and lots of other folks, really, really a, a neat story. But he describes the prayer meetings in particular at that revival in a special way. He says, you know, they weren't anything fancy. The prayers were short and simple and to the point. Someone would pray for God to reach her wayward son who'd gotten in bad company. And there was a chorus in the room of amens and yes, lords. Someone else would pray, Lord, bless the poor woman down the street, the one with the black eye. I'll try to bring her tonight. And then another prayed for God to bring conviction and conversion to the man who gave her the black eye. Well, during this prayer gathering where these simple short prayers were being prayed, there was a theological student in his second year of Bible college. My Bible college friends will know what this so, you know. And he didn't like the idea of these brief and humble prayers, so he decided to show the folks how to pray, and he launched into a lengthy oration, as Orr calls it. And it went something like this. We thank thee, Heavenly Father, that in spite of the disobedience of our first parents, that the seed of the woman didst bruise the serpent's head, and thy planned its triumph. And we thank thee that in spite of the wickedness of the world, thou didst shut the family of Noah in the ark to persevere thy seed. And then he prayed on about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the children of Israel and Moses. And, and uh, Or says he was traveling with great velocity through Second Kings when the minister interrupted him and said, Open your eyes, man. You're not praying. You're preaching a sermon. Right. Well, or continues on. He says, after that, we continued on with profitable intercession and sincere petition. And the answers did come. The answers did come. So for me, over the last probably four months or so, I've been wrestling with how to start the new year for us as a church. Um, you know, what series, what sermons, what scriptures. And I, I figured we would probably start with something on prayer because we start our, our year with prayer every year as a church, and that's, that's who we are as a church, part of our culture as a church, is we are a praying church. We pray before, during, and after everything we do, everything. Uh, it's, just, it's just who we are. We, we go forward on our knees. We're in dependence on God. So uh, I knew that. We had all kinds of options. You know, we could talk on this subject or this subject or this subject or this theme in prayer and so on. But uh, I just couldn't settle on any of them. And, and uh, during that time, I, I came across a series of sermons on revival uh, by a guy named Ashwin Romani. He was actually part of a church that experienced some powerful revival in Calgary, Alberta. And uh, something about that series struck a chord in my heart. And I thought that might be it. I just stayed on it. I just let it ruminate. But over the next several weeks, it just kept coming back and back and back again. I figured this is what we're going to talk about together as a church. I call it Revive Us Again. Now, revival is an exciting topic, but we're going to look particularly today at Psalm 85. Psalm 85 uh, is, a, is a psalm that is, is really a prayer for revival. But the book of Psalms is a book of prayers. And it's really like God's instruction manual for his people on how to pray. Or maybe better said, it's a companion guide for prayer. In fact, if you're just praying, one of the great ways to, to, to talk to God is to take the Psalms and pray them back to him. And they contain kind of every range of human need and emotion as you work your way through them. Well, this, this is the way Psalm 85 goes. I'll, I'll start right at the beginning. This is verse 1. He says, you, Lord, showered your favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and you covered all their sins. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. So the first three verses of this psalm is just the psalmist describing a season in the nation of Israel where there was God's favor and blessing. 
A season when God was forgiving and moving by his grace on the people, and and it was a, a beautiful time. Now, the centerpiece of the psalm, the very next part, is where the psalmist says, okay, God, you did it before, now I'm praying you'll do it again. And here's what he says. Restore us again, God our Savior, and put away your displeasure toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not, and here it is, revive us again? That your people may rejoice in you. Show us your unfailing love, Lord, and grant us your salvation. God, you forgave. You came. You dwelt in the midst of your people. You did all these awesome things. But that was in a previous generation. God, be God of my generation. Do again today in this generation what you've done before. My generation needs a fresh move of God, a fresh move of the Spirit of God. And he cries out on behalf of his people. He cries out that they would find their highest joy and their greatest treasure in God, that they would freshly experience God's love and God's salvation. And the rest of the psalm, actually, I won't read it all to you, but it just goes on to pray the vision of that revival, which by the way, your prayers reveal your vision. Did you know that? What you pray for. That's why it's good to to hear each other's prayers because you hear each other's hearts. When you hear your pastor's prayer, you get to know your pastor's vision. So I'm always always listening to the prayers of people because it it carries, you you pray what you want, right? What you long for. So he he prays this revival. He, He prays that the land would be filled with glory, with God's glory. He prays that people would not go back to their foolishness, but they would live in God's ways. He prays that righteousness and blessing would flow from an open heaven over the people, and there'd be bountiful harvest and the smile of God, and that God himself would be in their midst. And here's what I think. I think Psalm 85 reflects a prayer that should be the prayer of every generation of God's people. That every generation of God's people would say to God, God, my generation, my generation needs a fresh move of your spirit, needs a fresh move of God. That our hearts, that every generation's hearts, including ours, would cry out, God, revive us again. Again, we've seen what you've done. We hear the stories. We read the stories. We hear in church history. But God, we want to see it in our day, in our time. Yeah, amen. So when you hear that word revival, of course, there's lots of things that that come up in our minds. A lot of us think of certain meetings because churches will sometimes have what we call revival meetings. Uh, even tent meetings. You ever heard of like tent revival meetings? Uh, some of you are, you know, from some years ago might have heard of those things. And you hear the word revival, you think, oh, it must mean a, a set of meetings. Other people, when they hear about revival, think about just sort of emotional encounters where people get really kind of worked up emotionally, worked into frenzies, weeping and crying and, and shouting and rejoicing and all kinds of emotional encounters. And uh, uh, that, that might be what you think of when you think of revival. Um, well, Revival certainly can include special meetings, and revival certainly can include emotional encounters. Um, But uh, revivals actually are not often consciously known about when they are happening. Revivals are most often looked back upon, and people realize that God was moving in their midst, that God was moving in their lives, that God was moving in other people's lives, and that people were being impacted, and society was being impacted, and so forth. Actually, do you know this? The, the noun revival, the word revival, is not even in the Bible. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Uh, it's, it's not there. What, what is there is the verb revive. Revive. And that happens many times through Scripture. And the word revive simply means to bring back to life, to quicken, to bring resurrection of life from the dead, a restoration of life, breathing something, breathing life into something that was dead or dying, the restoration or returning of something to its true nature and purpose. So here's here's what revival is. Revival is a special work of God among the people of God. And, And here's why we need revival. Because when we receive Jesus into our lives, we receive life. That's what the Bible tells us. We receive spiritual life. When we invite Jesus into our lives, he becomes our Lord, our Savior, and he makes us come alive. The Bible calls that being born anew or born again. 
But here's the, the challenge. The reality is, if we're not careful, that spiritual life that comes on the inside of us, over time, it can recede. It can fade. It can diminish over time. And we need God, by His Holy Spirit, to awaken us, to restore, to renew that life within us. Actually, a powerful image of, of revival in Scripture is a fire. Uh, this last summer, I went on what we called an epic father-daughter camping trip. I went with my daughter. And we went to three different national parks in the U.S. and drove over a thousand kilometers together. We hiked what felt like hundreds of kilometers. I'm not sure what it was, but we hiked a lot. And at the end of a, a long day, we, our feet would be just so tired. We'd be at the campground. And of course, one of the wonderful things you can do is it gets dark and it gets chilly at night in the mountains. One of the wonderful things you can do is light a fire. And you sit by that fire and you feel the warmth of that fire. But inevitably, what happens? You don't have to do anything to the fire. And what happens to it? It dies down, right? And pretty soon, all you've got left is just some, some embers. And one of the coolest things you can do well, this is just part of what I love about campfires with those embers is you can kind of stir them and then blow on them, add a little bit of fuel to them, and you can turn a dying fire, just a few warm enders, back into a roaring blaze, Amen. right? That's a great image of revival. But just like a fire dies down all by itself, the, the, the default mode of the human heart is to become spiritually lukewarm, to lose spiritual passion, and, and, and really to, to kind of be influenced to, by the, the patterns of the world around us, by the coldness towards God of the world around us. And so all through Scripture, you actually see this, a pattern of, of backsliding and then renewal, backsliding and renewal. God, uh, with, with Israel, repeatedly, Israel would lose their spiritual zeal, give in to idol worship, uh, wander far from God, compromise their faith. And then God, through, through prophets, through his spirit, sometimes through suffering, he calls them back and revives them again and again. And actually, in the New Testament, we, we see something of the same thing. The New Testament actually starts in revival, right? God breaking in on the scene, literally, Jesus coming. We just celebrated that in the Christmas season. God breaking in on the silence, the sin, the suffering, the emptiness of the world. Jesus shining light into the darkness. It's super cool. When you read the Gospels of, of just Jesus arriving, I mean, he brings life and hope and healing. Everywhere he goes, he speaks, is strengthening to people. All these great things happen in the ministry of Jesus. And what does he say? He says, the kingdom of God is here, right? God is imminent. God is in the midst of his people, Woo, right? It's revival. Say hallelujah. Heaven has invaded earth. Yeah. Right? That's the New Testament. And while he's doing that, he gathers these disciples, people he's training, and he gives them his heart. He gives them his kingdom. He gives them his love. And he fills them with the spirit. And he says, now, you guys spread the fire. Right? And the church is born. The church is born in revival. They're praying. The spirit descends, right? The, this wind blows, tongues of fire come upon each one of them. They declare the praises of God. People come by the multitudes. And then thousands of lives are transformed as they get to know Jesus for themselves and are forgiven. And those thousands of lives share with more. And they impact thousands upon thousands. And the way it says it in Acts is they turn the world upside down. Amen. It's awesome to read about. It's really exciting. Of course, uh, it's interesting, at the very same time, it doesn't take long for there to be also to be some struggles, for the fire to die down, for the human heart to default towards being lukewarm. Actually, Acts chapter 2, the church is birthed in revival. You see all these great things happening, chapter 3, chapter 4. Do you know by chapter 5, there's already sin issues that they got to deal with? By chapter 6, there's grumbling and complaining. And as you work your way through the book of Acts, the church deals with fear and complacency and false beliefs and all of these things. And, and you find yourself just kind of saying, really? Really? Even the spirit-filled, blood-bought church of Jesus? <laughs> really? And of course, the answer is, yep. Yep. That's the way human hearts are. And at the same time, as you read about the church struggling in these ways, you also see the mercy of God, the relentless love of God, the, 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 the people returning to God in prayer and being filled and refilled again and again and again with the Holy Spirit. 
And as you read through the rest of the New Testament, you read these letters to the churches, and you do see revival. You see the churches on fire, the message spreading, great things happening. But you also see, you also see exhortations to those churches to say, hey, guys, stay alert. Stop flirting with sin. Hold fast to the truth. Refuse the ways of the world. Tend your spiritual fires and cling and pursue the Lord. Cling to and pursue the Lord and his ways with all your might. Why? Because that's what the church needs to hear. In fact, the very last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, near the beginning of that book, Jesus speaks to the church in what we call the seven letters to the churches of Asia Minor. And there's these seven churches addressed, I think representing us, you know, all all the different stages and phases of church life. And uh, as Jesus talks to those churches, he has some good things to say. He's like, Atta B, you know, these are great. But he also has some rebukes to offer them. And I actually want to share with you that five of the seven churches receive rebukes. Uh, Two of the seven, they only get encouragement. They're just like, good job, hanging on through tough times. You guys are doing awesome. But five of the seven get rebukes. And I want to share them with you. Actually, just hide those for one second. Before. Hide them, hide them. There we go. Okay, they're going to come back. But just before I read them, here's what I want you to do as I read through these. I don't want you to think of the Old Testament people of Israel and how, yeah, those guys backslid. They let their fire grow cold. I don't want you to think about the New Testament church, which in this case is only decades old when this was written. I don't even want you to think about the church around the world today or Victory Church here. I want you to think of your own heart. And I want you to hear the challenge of Jesus to every one of our hearts who have a tendency to move in the direction of these things that are challenged here. So now we can put them up. There we go. The first church is challenged because they've left their first love. They've left their first love. On the outside, we look good. But Jesus says, your passion is gone. The heart, the most important part is missing. That flame within. The second challenge comes to a church that has compromised their beliefs. They've they've gone with the ideas of the culture around them. And in particular, with the sexuality of the culture around them. And uh, he just says, hey, you've got to repent. You've got to change your way of thinking back to what God's word says. The third church that's challenged has mixed with idolatry and immorality. Actually, very similar to the church before it. Apparently, that's an easy one for us to get dragged down by. The fourth challenge is the church has fallen into spiritual lethargy. And he says to them, you guys, you you think you're alive, but you're dead. You're sleeping and you need to wake up. And then the fifth challenge just says, man, you've become lukewarm. There's an indifference to your faith. There's a carelessness about it. You think you're doing fine. He says to them, he says, "You, you, you, you look at yourself in the mirror and you think you look fine. But the truth is, when I x-ray your heart, God says, there's some trouble there. So, here's here's what, what we need to understand from all of this. Whether it's the Old Testament, the New Testament, or the present day, God's people, us kind of people, are prone to wander, prone to leave the God we love. So, a fire is a good illustration. Another good illustration for this in Scripture, or metaphor for this, is... Uh, a wake up or a challenge to wake up, a wake up call. Um, that's the one that Jesus uses for the church in, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. He says, I know the things you do. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up! <laughs> I love that. This is a great thing for a preacher to get to say once in a while. Wake up! Right? It's like, I see you. Wake up! Right? Uh, strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead dead, right? The embers are dying. Wake up. We're tempted to fall asleep when we feel at ease, when everything seems good in our lives. That's why trials can sometimes be a gift to us to keep us awake, spiritually speaking. We're tempted to sleep the longer we're at something. That's why as followers of Christ, uh, as you continue on in your faith journey, it's important to stay growing, to stay learning, to stay fresh. But three times in Paul's letters, he uses that phrase, wake up. He says it to the Roman church. He says it to the Thessalonian church. And he says it to the Ephesian church. Three times, wake up. All three of those churches, by the way, are exemplary churches. They're great churches, but they need to hear a wake up call. 
Ephesians 5, uh, it says it this way, Awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, Christ will give you life. And in the context, Paul is saying, don't be careless about your life. God's brought you out of darkness into the light, so live like it. He's saying it's so easy to slide back, little by little, compromise by compromise, inch by inch. Don't do it. Live with urgency. Be alert. Don't be careless. Don't be thoughtless. Why? Because when you start to sleep, you, you, you lack an awareness to reality, right? You, you're, you're not really present to the Lord and to his mission. When, when you're asleep, you're vulnerable to attack. And there's an enemy who wants to destroy you and a battle that you're in. When you're asleep, the truth is you look no different than when you're dead. You're in a state of inactivity. And what happens to us when we lose our spiritual fires is we look the same as the world around us. The light no longer shines from our lives. There's actually a guy in the Bible who gets this, this almost these same words of a wake-up call. His name's Jonah. And Jonah is this prophet in the Old Testament who God calls to be on mission, and he runs away from the mission. And as he's running from the mission, he's in the bottom of this boat, and there's a storm, but he's fast asleep. And the captain of the boat, the pagan captain of the boat, says these words to him. He says, what do you mean, O sleeper? Arise and call on your God. Even the pagan captain knows what Jonah needs to be doing. Right? Uh, one of the neat things that, that I got the privilege of as a young man was getting to travel some. My parents actually lived in Kuwait for a few years. And my brother and I one time were uh, visiting my parents and we got to spend some time in Egypt. And while we were in Egypt, we were staying in this hotel. We'd just gotten there and we're trying to figure out which way is up. If you've ever done traveling across the world, you you know, you can't figure out the time and it's just the sun comes up at the wrong time and your brain doesn't work with that. And it's really hard to, to just get your, your calendar worked out. And uh, we needed to wake up at the right time. So we were told this. We were told, hey, make sure you talk to your hotel and get a wake-up call. Now, I didn't even know there was such a thing as a wake-up call. Do you guys know you can get wake-up calls in hotels? That's yeah, kind of cool. So... We were like, I don't know, how do you do that? We're like looking through the little book and they, oh, oh, you, you know, so we called the front desk. We said, hi, could we get a wake-up call? Oh, sure, you can get a wake-up call. What time? So we said, 7 a.m., give us a wake-up call. So sure enough, we fall asleep and we're totally groggy. We're out of it. And the phone rings, 7 in the morning. My brother picks up the phone and, you know, he's on the phone for a little bit. And then he hangs up the phone and he starts laughing. Well, I'm barely waking up and I'm like, what are you laughing about? We're, we're out of it. And he says, you should have heard them on the phone. They said this, good morning. This is your wake-up call. Come up, come up, come on. <laughs> and he just said, you know, they basically sang me a cheerful wake-up call. <laughs> and he's like, you know, what a, you know, you, you just, it's so ironic because when you're woken up, you're grumpy, you're tired, you're trying to get the cobwebs out of your brain. It's just, good morning, right? This is your wake-up call. Yeah. What's interesting, all these churches that God writes to in Revelation, he's given them wake-up calls. These churches that Paul writes to, Romans, Thessalonians, Ephesians, wake up, right? And you can kind of think God's mad at you. You can kind of think God's out to get you. You can kind of feel a little bitter about it, right? Why'd you wake me up? Let me sleep. This is harsh. This is a hard word, pastor. Why, why are you giving us that mean revival sermon again, right? But here's the thing. Here's the thing. And God actually says this in the, to the lukewarm church, the last church in Revelation. He says this. He says, I'm sharing these challenges to you because I love you. Because I want what's best for you. Hey, Jonah, you're going to die in the bottom of that boat. Wake up. Wake up. I have so many good things for you. Wake up. There's so much more for you in 2024. Don't sleep through it. Don't miss out on what God has. Don't miss out on, on, on the, the fire and the life and the hope and the purpose and the healing and the God being in your midst. Wake up. I love you. That's what you need to hear from God today. Yeah. He cares. He cares. And he really, really wants you to experience his life and his fullness and his joy and his open heaven over your life this year. So, 
We should want this. We should pray for this over our world. God, bring revival to our world. We see the darkness in our world. It breaks our hearts, and we pray for our world. In our generation, God, move afresh, right? Be in the midst of this world. Shine your light. But for God to move in our world, he needs to move in our country. And we should pray for Canada, and our hearts should break for this country when we see the darkness and the brokenness in this country. We just pray, God, revive us again. Move in this country. Shine your light. Break in, God. Let heaven invade earth in my country. And of course, for God to move in this country, he needs to move in Saskatchewan. And to move in Saskatchewan, he needs to move in Moose Jaw. And to move in Moose Jaw, he needs to move in our churches. And to move in our churches, he needs to move in this church, in Victory Church. And to move in Victory Church, he needs to move in your family. And to move in your family, he needs to move in your heart. Revival starts right here. Right? Right there. Yeah. So I'll close by telling you a story about a guy named Gypsy Smith. Gypsy Smith uh, lived from 1860 to 1947. His real name was Rodney Smith. He was born in humble origins in a gypsy tent on the outskirts of London. He was 16 years old when he made a decision for Christ, and he had this burning desire to tell other people about the joy and the hope that he had found in Jesus, and he couldn't help himself. I mean, everywhere he went as a 16-year-old boy, he just told people about Jesus. In fact, he couldn't read or write, but he taught himself how to read and write just so he could share the gospel. That's why he taught himself that. And uh, they, they said, you could, if you were looking for, for uh, Rodney, <laughs> you, you could find him singing to someone on the street about Jesus. Or telling them about Jesus. And that's how, actually how he got the name, the Singing Gypsy Boy. That was his nickname. Eventually that nickname evolved into Gypsy Smith. As he shared Jesus with everybody around him, over time that became to, to groups and, and in services and so on. He actually became a missionary with the Salvation Army. He, he became so well known that he would travel all over the world. He, he crossed the Atlantic 45 times in his ministry life. Preached the gospel to millions of people. He was invited to the White House by presidents two times. Gypsy Smith. <laughs> and it is said that he never preached, not at one time, without someone surrendering their life to Jesus. That everywhere he went, revival broke out. A group of people were sent to him one time and they just asked him this. They said, how do you have a revival? everywhere you go. And he answered very simply. He says this. He says, go home. Lock yourself in your room. Kneel in the middle of the floor and with a piece of chalk, draw a circle around yourself and there on your knees, pray fervently and brokenly that God would start a revival within that circle. And so that's how we're going to end the service today. We're, we're going to Pray just like that. We're not going to wait till we get home. We're going to draw a circle around ourselves. I was tempted to hand out pieces of chalk, really. So we're just going to say, God, we're praying Psalm 85. We've seen what you've done before. Do it again in our generation. Actually, Habakkuk summarizes Psalm 85 so well. Habakkuk 3, verse 2, he says, Lord, I've seen the report about you, and I stand in awe of your deeds. In other words, I've, I've heard all this stuff about you, God. So revive your work in these years. Make it known in these years. In your wrath, remember mercy. I don't deserve it, God. I don't deserve it, God. But where my spiritual passion has been waning and where my love has grown cold, oh, God, would you fire me up again? God, would you wake me, wake us from spiritual slumber to the reality of your presence. Why don't you stand with me and we'll just pray this. You just pray in your own hearts. I'll lead us through it. But God, I pray you would free us from nominal, sleepy Christianity. God, we just choose right now to draw a circle around ourselves and cry out to you. Come with a divine visitation of your spirit. Come down in power. Lord, we pray like it says in Isaiah 64, oh God, that you would rend the heavens and come down and that the mountains would quake at your presence. God, blow a fresh wind of your spirit upon our lives. Intensify your work, amplify your voice, lift us to new levels. 
realign us, God. Turn us back to you. God, make us zealous for your glory. Give us a passion for souls to reach our family and friends and neighbors. Set our hearts ablaze, God, for you. Make us a people of earnest and fervent prayer. Lord, a people who will truly seek your face with our whole hearts. Wake us up, God. Wake us up in your love, in your mercy. Wake us up. You know, I want to just pray for one other thing. If you're here today and you just say, I don't really know where, where I'm at with Jesus, where I stand with Jesus. Not sure I've received him into my life. I mentioned earlier that when a person receives Jesus, receives Jesus, they get spiritual life put into them. And if you're not sure, you've clearly done that. Man, it'd be great to do that today. To just bring your own heart before God and just say, Jesus, I want to receive you. Actually, I want to just give you a chance to, to express that. If we could just close our eyes, bow our heads. And if you're here today and you just say, I'd like to receive Jesus into my heart, into my life today. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand and just say, yeah, that's me today. I'm doing that right here, right now. Yeah, a few there, a few over here. Anybody else? You just say, yeah, today's my day. I want to do that right now. We're going to say a prayer together. I want to invite you to pray it with me. And all, let's all of us pray it so that nobody prays alone. But if you raise your hand or you wish you would have raised your hand, those of you online, if you're saying, I'm stepping into this, pray this. Mean it with your heart. Let's believe God's doing a, a miracle right in your heart today. So, Lord Jesus, I come to you now. I know I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. I turn from my sins and I ask you to forgive me. Please save me. Make me your child. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I now give my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Why don't we give God a hand for just doing that in people's lives? So good.